tiny patch of land for which Japan has sacrificed a fleet of warships and thousands of fighting men still bristles with United States bombers. For the forces that control Guadalcanal command the approaches to Australia, hold mastery of the skies over the vitally important Solomon Islands. Today, these land-based bombers are leading the way as the combined United States land, sea, and air offensive begins the task of sweeping the Japs from the South Pacific. No armchair commander, Admiral Nimitz comes all the way from Hawaii to decorate Major General Vandegrift, whose fighting Marines captured the airfield from the Japs and held it against all odds. Highest honors are awarded officers and men alike. Majors, captains, privates, they've proven themselves in the test by fire. One youngster has 10 Jap bombers and 19 fighter planes to his credit. One of the outstanding records of the war. These are the men who bore the brunt of the battle. Now, with reinforcements newly arrived, they're ready to push on. Marching single file, long columns of fighting men stream across the island in pursuit of the enemy. Once, the little men of Nippon were in complete control here. Now, they're on the run. Plunging into malaria-infested jungles, the Marines steadily, doggedly enlarge their hold on the island. At an advanced base, they enjoy their first rest in weeks. They have the advantage of an uninterrupted supply line, and they get nothing but the best. take no chances on being surprised by roving Jap patrols. Any line may be the front line on Guadalcanal, and they dig in as they advance. Machine guns always on the ready. Artillerymen back up the infantry, blasting the Japs from the island. United States cruiser Boise, given up for lost, makes port with the most amazing record of the war. The score, painted on the bridge, six Jap warships sunk in 27 minutes. Admiral King, commander of the fleet, comes aboard to salute and decorate her gallant crew. Against overwhelming odds, the Boise skipper, Captain Mike Moran, brought his ship through. And now the boys are ready to go back for more. Honors, Ecuador's President Carlos Arroyo del Rio is welcome to Washington. Secretary of State Hull is first to greet the good neighbor from South America who comes to strengthen the ties of friendship. President Roosevelt personally introduces members of the United States Cabinet to the Ecuadorian Chief Executive. President Arroyo backs up his sympathy for the United Nations with the important coastal and island bases in the Pacific, bases that guard the western approaches to the Panama Canal. United States troops occupying Casablanca salute General Nogus, governor of French Morocco, as he comes to meet the American commander, General Patton. At the Miramar Hotel, headquarters of the Western Task Force, General Patton and French military leaders agree upon terms of United States occupation. Leave the hotel in complete accord. A so-called Nazi Armistice Commission that arrived two days before United States forces landed is rounded up. Now, beneath the bayonets of United States infantrymen, they take their exercise.
Down the Mediterranean, barrage balloons protect the French colonial harbor of Algiers against low-level air attack. But 16 hours after the Americans landed, authorities agreed to the city surrender. In the Hotel Saint-Georges, negotiations were completed. French Morocco and Algiers are in allied hands. General Nogus, now allied with the United Nations. British Admiral Cunningham, United States General Clark, General Eisenhower in supreme command. Italian members of the Axis Armistice Commission, who met the same fate as the Germans at Casablanca, leave the Hotel Angleterre, carefully guarded by American soldiers. They get a fond farewell from the good people of Algiers. into Algiers pours a steady stream of troops ready for the big push east. Fighting men of Britain's first army, veterans of Dunkirk, eager for a return engagement with the Nazis. On to join forces with Montgomery. Their goal, to rout every Nazi from the soil of Africa. the Mediterranean, the French harbor of Toulon became the center of worldwide speculation. For here was the home port of the main French fleet. What would they do? Seventy-five mighty vessels, their guns silenced for two and a half years. In them might rest the balance of allied naval power in the Mediterranean. Suddenly came word, the Nazis speeding to take over. And from the flagship of French Admiral Jean de Laborde flashed the order, scuttle the fleet. Nearly the entire fleet was put out of commission. Only a few undamaged units fell into Nazi hands. Four submarines braved the minefilled harbor and escaped. In one dramatic stroke, Patriot crews struck out to avenge the honor of France.